Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. This week, our show is dedicated to browsers and their security. So before the show, I did a quick look up just to see how popular various browsers are and how often they're used. And the numbers that I came up with vary, you know, based on who is writing the article, but Chrome came out around 49% of all browsers that are being used. Safari is 31%. And most of that is probably on iOS. Edge is at 7%. IE is at 6%. And Firefox is 3%. And then there were a couple other ones that barely made a dent, like Brave, Opera, Vivaldi, those sorts of browsers. But as you can see, the majority of the browsers that are being used mostly for desktop is Chrome. And probably some of that is on Android as well. So why do we want to talk about browser security? And one of the things is, you know, in today's world, a lot of people equate that with computing in general. When they go to a computer, web browsers are their gateway to everything that they do. Web apps, websites, there are operating systems built solely around the web browser and they're used very, very frequently, they run code, they run um, all sorts of different things that, if not done securely, can impact your system. Most browsers by default are not in a secure configuration. And there's an increased threat from cyber criminals to try to exploit vulnerable browsers. I don't think I've seen a week where there hasn't been another zero day that's been reported for like Chrome or Firefox or something like that. So, and then of course, like that gets compounded by the fact that users often click on links without thinking. Websites can be disguised to redirect you to a malicious site. We did an episode on evil jinx, which is kind of the way that they compromise machines. Extensions also increase the attack surface. Oftentimes, third-party extensions will have no mechanism to update. They're so subject to a supply chain attack. One of the examples that actually was in the news recently was a an extension called the Great Suspender, which was super popular. I believe it prevented the browser from suspending the session, which is one of those things that Chrome does to try to save memory. It'll suspend a tab and release that resource back so that you can continue to use it. So very popular add-on. About 2 million people downloaded it for Chrome. And the person who wrote the extension sold it to an undisclosed buyer. And before the deal was done, they had turned over the keys to their GitHub. And that buyer uploaded malicious code and updated the extension on the back end with crypto miners and tracking and all sorts of stuff that you don't want for your browser and extensions to be doing. So... There's a lot of different reasons why, as an enterprise, securing your browsers is one of the biggest defenses that you can work on. When it comes to the different browsers, what do you think, Adam, that most organizations should look at for the browser that's built into Windows 10, like Edge? Uh, 
So we all remember Internet Explorer being ubiquitous in IT because it was built in and it was built to be managed. And so even though it wasn't a very good browser, even though it wasn't very fast, even though it wasn't standards compliant, you saw most organizations pretty broadly deploy it. And as Internet Explorer has made its slow and gradual decline, I note in the statistics you gave Andy that it still has a greater market share than Firefox, which is cringy to say the least. Um, organizations have had to look elsewhere and look at some other options because it just honestly isn't tenable to stay on Internet Explorer for your users day to day browsing. That's honestly a really bad idea. Although technically people always ask, when is Internet Explorer going to go out of support? And it is technically still supported because it's supported on any operating system that it ships with if the OS is still supported. And so since it still ships with many versions of Windows 10 and those versions are still supported, IE lives on as well, believe it or not. So um, a lot of organizations went and looked at Chrome, which made a ton of sense because Chrome from a rendering engine perspective is so ubiquitous, right? Today, if you're using a Chromium based browser, you can expect very, very, very high compatibility. Websites are going to render and load and function pretty much as intended. That's a good thing. We don't want to run into compatibility issues with our browsers. However, wouldn't it be great if you had a browser that shipped with the OS and had the manage manageability that Internet Explorer was famous for and the previous version of Edge, but was really compatible, had a Chromium based rendering engine and, and ran all the things and ran them well and ran them quickly. Well, that's what, you know, we, we called it the new edge. If you've listened to Windows Weekly, they called it Credge or um, other various names that were smashing, you know, Chrome and Edge together. But it's, um, it's the only version that's supported now. So once upon a time, you had to kind of clarify, do you mean the old edge or the new edge? Well, legacy edge is completely unsupported now. It's not supported at all. Um, so you have to be running the new edge if you're running any version of it. So all's that to say, I think this is a great place for enterprises to look because you're going to get the manageability you crave. You're going to get something that's built by Microsoft and supported as part of the OS, but you're still going to get that compatibility and that speed that you get with the Chromium engine. So kind of a best of both worlds kind of scenario. And so if you're looking at edge, certainly it's going to have manageability through control planes like Intune, GPO, the standard ways you know how to manage browsers in the past on the Mac through a P list on mobile devices through MDM. So certainly all the manageability characteristics you'd expect, and then some other benefits that come along for the ride, like single sign on for anything that uses Azure AD. You can actually sign in with Azure AD credentials and then do sync, which is great for replacing user endpoint devices over time where if their favorites and their extensions and their history and their open tabs even all sync from their old device to their new device, that's a great user experience, super easy to do. It's built right into the browser. So there's a lot of good happening here. And I think organizations that maybe previously didn't look at Edge, I get it. It wasn't compatible. It was slow. It wasn't widely used across the web. It had very, very, very little uptake. Maybe it's time for a fresh look at it because now the new edge, the current edge kind of gives you that best of both worlds scenario. Andy, kind of what's your take on, on edge as we talk about different browsers for our listeners? I personally think that this is the way to go for enterprises because it's built into the windows 10 operating system. And now that it is on the Chromium rendering engine, like you said, Adam, all of the websites are going to have a very high chance of rendering correctly. And that wasn't the case with the old edge that was built on HTML5. And so there are other benefits from a security aspect to going with edge as well that is better than the other browsers. So for example, it has and integrates with Windows Defender for endpoint on smart screen, where it can check on downloads, 
pups, malicious URLs. It is also the only browser that natively supports hardware isolation on Windows 10 through a feature called Windows Defender Application Guard. Now we've touched on this feature in Windows 10 before, and I'll just mention it as part of the browser security. It is a feature where when you enable it, it can run a sandboxed version using hardware isolation of the browser. And so whatever you do within that browser session is then sandboxed. So if you happen to click on a link that redirects you to a malicious site or happen to download something, it'll stay within that sandboxed version of Edge. So really cool stuff. And that's the only browser that natively supports it. If you want to go with something else, you'll have to use some sort of third-party hardware isolation, which can get a little bit dicey because now you're introducing more surface threat to your operating system. I love that feature and it's legit, right? I mean, it's built on Hyper-V. It's the same isolations that's used in the cloud in Azure, essentially. At, at the end of the day, it's that same tech under the hood. And so really, really powerful, really strong isolation where there's just not going to be an escape there, at least not an obvious or an easy one. Um, for malicious code to, to do anything. And so the way you configure that is you can say, for trusted sites, you don't need to do this. If we're on you know, our Office 365 tenant or the company intranet or these other trusted SaaS apps, then not required. But for anything else, run in that virtualized mode, that isolated mode and be cautious. So that's pretty cool. Well, a couple other things they like just high level, um, Microsoft's working to introduce things like support for almost a MAM style model where there's, there's kind of DLP that's built into the browser where it can detect that if you have a file that is company data, it shouldn't go to non-company locations. So there's some cool stuff being worked on there. Um, also IE mode, and this is, this is kind of funny. So I should mention, of course, and I do frequently on the show, I work for Microsoft and we have this ancient, ancient time and absence reporting tool. It's literally called tar. And the way you get to it is if you're on CorpNet or VPN, it's whack, whack tar. It's, it's a super old site. It's on-prem and I swear we keep it around so we can demo IE mode at, at events like build or ignite. And it's slick. You go to that site and you see the little old school blue E appear in the tab and behind the scenes, Edge has called up the old Trident IE rendering engine instead of Chromium and used it to render just that site. And so you can, as an IT administrator, tell Edge which sites load in IE mode and they happen seamlessly and invisibly to users so they don't have to make a conscientious decision. It just happens automatically. Hopefully at this point, you know which apps in your environment still require IE and hopefully you can count them on one hand, hopefully. And this is something that's trivial to set up and delivers a great, great user experience. And again, you know, that's going to be something that's unique to edge to be able to do that versus having to train your users. Well, we, you know, we're standardized on Chrome, but for these three apps, then you need to go find the blue E like, wouldn't it just be easier if you took care of it for your users? Well, with edge, you can. So love IE mode. I think that's a really cool feature as well. Yeah. I also will add that going back to Windows Defender Application Guard, oftentimes as security professionals, we need some sort of sandbox to test something, right? Like a user sends us a file or a user sends us a link. And some maybe some of you have a Kali Linux VM that you keep sp spun up for that specific purpose. There's also something in Windows called the Windows Sandbox that you can enable. It's just like a quick thing that you can bring up a sandbox environment of Windows to do some stuff. But I used to use Defender Application Guard quite a bit to go to different sites that I wasn't sure if this was malicious or not, or I tried downloading something and I knew that it would stay within that sandbox environment. So really helpful for security analysts, incident response, forensics, that type of stuff too. So moving on to Chrome, Chrome is Again, one of the populous, the most popular browser that's out there. 
And most likely your users are using it. They probably have Gmail addresses. They have Google accounts. Chrome is supported just like the way Edge is. There's an ADMX file that you can ingest and control it through GPO. You can do it through Intune. Same thing on a Mac. You can manage it through a plist. As I was researching stuff for this episode, I found some documentation, which I'll put in the show notes, of a new way that they're doing browser management called the Chrome Browser Cloud Management. I haven't tested this myself, but I read through the documentation for it, and it seemed pretty cool. It's free for enterprises, and you can sign up and essentially manage Chrome browsers from a web GUI. And you can deliver policy, essentially, and configurations without having to do it through GPO. Now, you do have to modify a reg key with an enrollment token. And there's options for Mac and, and even Linux to do this. So you have to have a way to modify that. And most likely it's going to be through SCCM or Intune or however you manage your devices. But once you have that on there, the users don't even need to sign in to Chrome. You can manage it just solely based on that reg key modification or other options on the other operating system. So really cool stuff. Chrome also has something called Chrome Remote Desktop that's built in to their browsers. It's a feature. It's similar to other remote desktop solutions like LogMeIn, TeamViewer, stuff like that. I highly, highly recommend that you have some sort of management solution to block this in your environment because what happens a lot, and this is my biggest issue with Chrome, is that Google automatically signs the user into the Chrome browser when the user goes to any one of their Google services. So if they go to Gmail and they sign into Gmail, well, guess what? Now they're signed into that Chrome browser. And what happens with that Chrome browser? Most likely it imports passwords, sites, histories, favorites, and it all syncs with their one at home. And that's great for the user, but now if you're going to corporate sites and you're saving them within the password manager within Chrome, then you're automatically taking those passwords back to home. And if that user leaves the company, it's still saved to their Chrome browser and their user and their personal stuff. So the main thing is, is that with remote desktop, because of the way Chrome behaves and how Google forces you to sign in, now you have a way to remote desktop into a corporate asset that is controlled by a personal identity and how many people have very very secure chrome password google passwords how many people automatically turn on mfa for their google accounts (laughs) well of course you do adam (laughs) you're in security but if you take the typical user my mom has a google account she does not have mfa turned on Right, because it's too much for a lot of users to have to get a text or go to their phone for the OTP. So, you know, that user gets compromised, and guess what? Now, an attacker has a foothold that is a remote way to access their desktop on a corporate asset. So, absolutely have some sort of management. There's GPOs that can turn it off, there's ways to do it. You can limit it to the intranet or VPN as well through uh, network firewall rule. For Chrome, I would recommend blocking the password vault as well. You know, for those reasons that I said, you know, you're uploading credentials to a personal profile. Now, it's different if you're on G Suite, of course. So then you are managing G Suite. So this is for most people who are using O365. On the Edge browser, you know, that's kind of a personal choice. Edge recently updated with their password vault to include something called password protection, which will scan the hashes of your 
passwords that are in there and compare them to dark web lists and whatnot and tell you if you have a password that is compromised. I don't hard recommend that you turn it off or on, mainly because with Edge, like Adam said, you have single sign-on into your Azure AD account. And so those identities then are controlled by your company and therefore so are the passwords. You know, Andy, I, I think we've stumbled into an interesting point or a thesis we can make here that I don't even know if we had considered at the top of the show. Why don't we suggest to our listeners that you should use the browser that's made by the same provider as your primary cloud productivity platform. If you're an O365 shop, you should run Edge. If you're a G Suite shop, you should run Chrome. It just makes sense. That way you're tying the browser in to that managed corporate identity. Like to your point, Edge will use an Azure AD account. If you're managing a Google account and it's an enterprise Google account you're signed into Chrome to, good on you, right? That's fine. You're probably doing some sort of enforcement around strength of password, maybe multiple factors. Um, obviously you also have made a decision to entrust your corporate data to Google. So less of an issue. This is, this is maybe just a really good idea, a good practice that you should align your browser decision to your cloud productivity platform. I like that. There are also two things that we would recommend if you're an 0365 shop and you are using Chrome, there's two extensions that you can get. One is the Windows 10 accounts extension, which enables single sign-on, and you'll need it for Azure AD device-based conditional access. So if you don't have it and you have conditional access and you try to access your company data, it's gonna be like, oh, you need to have this extension and you need to be signed into it. The other one is Chrome is able to leverage that Windows 10 hardware isolation that we talked about through a an extension called uh, the Microsoft Defender Application Guard extension. And what that does is essentially it launches Edge to leverage the Application Guard isolation, but it doesn't do it in Chrome. So if you're in Chrome, you have a policy to have certain sites, like Adam talked about with the safe sites, to go to Windows Defender Application Guard, you can use the extension to then launch an instance of Defender Application Guard browser, but it's still in Edge, right? So like we said, if you want to do it in Chrome, you're going to need some sort of third-party isolation. So the last browser that I wanted to chat about is Firefox, because that's kind of the other big one that's out there, right? It's only 3%, but there's quite a few people who use Firefox still, if you just consider the numbers. And this is the same thing as the other browsers. There's an ADMX file in their GitHub that you can ingest into Intune, ingest into Windows to run GPOs on. There's a plist for Macs. One of the important things to know with Firefox is that it actually has its own certificate store. So if you have company certificates, you have your own certs that you trust and you deliver them to the machine through group policy or domain joining or Intune or however you do it, you'll need to add them to Firefox as well. Or there is a policy that you can turn on to say, have Firefox trust the machine certs. So either way, but just know that Firefox has its own certificate store by default. On that same note as well, Firefox also does not by default pass through like Windows credentials for single sign-on, which both Chrome and Edge do, but Firefox does not. And sometimes that can be beneficial. If you're in a scenario where I've heard of scenarios like where you have a training room where you might have 20, 25 PCs in there and they're signed in with a local account or, or some sort of um, service account that is, you know, not a, a human identity. It's like a machine identity. Um, you don't want to try to single sign on into Office 365, for example, because it's going to, you know, bork and say, I don't have 
an inbox or whatever. So those are scenarios where Firefox is just a great tool in the toolbox where you can say for those scenarios, let's use Firefox because it won't do any sort of pass through authentication by default. And when I go to Office 365, it's going to say, Hey, who are you? You know, give me your username. Let's go. And that can be really handy. I used to use that a lot to demo like different tenants, like a demo tenant. And I wanted to make sure I didn't get automatically signed into my Office 365 tenant. Now today I, I actually use the multiple profiles feature in Edge. So that kind of solves that itch. But I bet there's still a ton of scenarios where it's actually handy that Firefox behaves in this way. It can be beneficial to you as opposed to a drawback. And Andy, I think, and I'm not 100% sure, but I think there's a way you can tell it, hey, I actually do want you to pass those credentials through. But I actually prefer this behavior in Firefox because there's so many times it's useful. From an administrative and security view, I use Firefox quite a bit in the corporate environment because we have separate identities that we need to sign into. One is my regular user and the other one is my administrative credentials. And I don't want to single sign on into my administrator credentials when I need them. You know, I want to sign into my normal credentials as single sign on. So we use Firefox quite a bit for that when use when new administrators come on and they're like, yeah, I'm trying to access the SaaS app with my admin credentials, but I can't, it keeps on signing me into my regular one. Well, okay, use Firefox. Chrome will always single sign on you in, whether it's a regular browser session or a private incognito browser session. It always honors that desktop SSO. I have found that with Edge, by design or not, that the regular browsers will single sign on you in, but the private mode of Edge will not. So oftentimes with that single sign on, I'll say, use either Edge in private mode, which there are benefits to doing that, right? You won't get session cookies or history or anything like that. So if you want to do it that way, that's fine. With Firefox, if I say, okay, Firefox is my dedicated admin browser, I'm going to get all that history and cookies and stuff that's a little bit easier to use, right? So benefits to both, um, but that's that's for single sign-on. And, and the browser profiles that you mentioned also is a really helpful productivity tip. I use edge profiles quite a bit, have different ones for different uh, identities. I also use Firefox containers, which is kind of the same thing. So containers is a little bit slicker in my opinion, because you don't have to have multiple browsers open. You can actually open a container tab and then you'll have all your favorites there and all the things and you can even tell Firefox to open a specific site within a container so that when you go to it, it says, Hey, I think you meant to go to this in this container. Do you want me to open it up in that container? So really cool stuff by separating your identities and having that for different browsers. Again, I would recommend disabling the password vault for Firefox because it's not going to sync with any corporate identity here. I would also block some of the, I don't know what you want to call them, like command config lines that you can go to, like about colon config, where you can turn on different types of encryption. You can do all sorts of other really granular configurations that most people won't do, but someone who's knowledgeable about Firefox can use that as an exploit to, to do certain things. So I would block that. There's also a setting there to disable certain security bypasses or enable them. So by default, Firefox, when you go to a site that is not secured through HTTPS or it recognizes it as a harmful site, which it actually uses Google's safe browsing algorithm on the back end to check that, it will display a warning. There's a thing to turn that off, and I would recommend not turning that off. So 
One of the other unique features of Firefox is that it's one of the only browsers out there that has the capability built in to do DNS over HTTPS. And we haven't done a deep dive on DNS over HTTPS, but in my opinion, for an enterprise, this is something you want to keep off, at least for now. For From a privacy aspect, I can certainly understand turning it on. But, you know, we had a DNS episode where we talked about the benefits of having visibility into those type of requests. And when you turn it on, it's going to show the DOH provider that is resolving that DNS and not your own DNS. So it's a way to bypass your own DNS. It's a way to essentially hide traffic. And when you have to do forensics on specific incidents, you're not going to have that visibility. So I'd recommend for enterprises to turn this off. And there's a couple other settings like safe browsing for edge and Chrome. Those are settings that I would turn on. And for Firefox, that's something that's turned on by default. The policy is actually called phishing slash malware and is turned on by default. You can turn it off, but something that I would recommend just keeping on. And then there's also a setting now for HTTPS only. This is kind of like dealer's choice again if you want to turn this on. The majority of sites these days are HTTPS as well, but sometimes you have corporate sites that may not be secured by HTTPS or do not automatically have a redirect. I've ran into those situations, so it all depends on your corporate environment. And kind of the elephant in the room is Safari. So what about Safari, Adam? So like you mentioned, Safari does have significant market share. However, we suspect the majority of that is probably iOS and iPad OS, which doesn't mean it doesn't matter, but that's going to be on your mobile devices. And you're probably, probably already comfortable with that because all of the controls for Safari are going to be enabled through MDM capabilities. So through a jam for an Intune or a mobile iron or a workspace one or a Moss 360, what have you, that's how you're going to manage Safari for the most part. So, um, I like Safari. I mean, as far as for your Mac users, it's going to deliver the best performance, the best battery life. It is super secure. It's super private. Um, lots to like about Safari, uh, for sure. But because it is Mac only, I mean, there was a windows version, but it's long gone. Um, I, I would imagine most enterprises just aren't going to standardize on it unless, you know, you're a hundred percent Mac shop just because now you're still going to have to have another browser on another platform versus everything else we've talked about, Firefox, Chrome, even yes, Microsoft Edge, all available on the Mac and are gonna be managed in more or less the same way. So no, no hate from Safari. I think Safari is a super secure, super fast, super great browser. Just through our enterprise lens, I, I don't think a lot of organizations, again, outside of a pure Mac shop, are, are gonna to wanna to standardize on it. I think that's the only real issue, but otherwise, hey, yeah, if. If you want to, if that trips your trigger, yeah, you, you're going to configure it through MDM. Um, a lot of these same controls we've talked about are, are going to be um, through there and supports a lot of the same capabilities as far as there's also, for example, you know, the ability to do password sync through iCloud Keychain. And again, that you may have a managed Apple ID that you use, but a lot of organizations don't. And so that user might be signing in again through personal credentials and there might be opportunity to walk off with some corporate data because that's all kind of stored and managed through a personal identity. So the same caveats that we've brought up multiple times apply to Safari as well. So I don't know. Did I miss anything on Safari there, Andy? No, I think you hit it all. For updates, I know this can kind of be a contentious topic for some organizations because maybe you're using an application that requires a certain version of that browser and if you are i probably would be asking you why because 
you should keep your browsers up to date. Uh, I mean, this is one of those things where it's it's not, let's wait a year before we update our browsers, you know, or even six months. I mean, there are hot fixes that are coming out weekly, sometimes multiple times during a week to update zero days and vulnerabilities within the browser sandbox escaping, you know, cross site scripting, stuff like that, that really bad stuff that you really want to keep up to date. And because you are clicking on links, because you don't know what is behind every single ad that is on the site, every single line of code that is redirecting things, trackers. I mean, there are so many things that are happening within a web browser that most users don't think about that all of it could have some sort of vulnerability that would be a remote code execution, sandbox escape into the operating system that you really do need to keep whatever browser you're using. I don't care what browser it is. You should have it be up to date at all times. You, you led with it at the top of the show. You brought it up again now and the horse is dead, but I'm going to kick it one more time. There is no other application on a computing device that makes more calls to foreign hosts that executes foreign code than a web browser, right? If you had any other application that's like, yeah, this calls out to random network hosts all the time. What? Oh yes. And this, um, parses and evaluates random code that we just feed to it and trust it. What? Like that's bananas, but that's what a browser does. And this is where, you know, I'm preaching to the choir. Everyone listening to the show gets it, right? But if you run into an application that your company uses and that vendor says you need to run specific version X, then you need to make it a holy war against that product until something gets better because that is not acceptable. That means they're not coding to standards. So that means and again, not like Chrome's going to disappear tomorrow or anything like that, but something should run in all browsers, right? If it's a web app, it should run in any HTML5 compliant browser. It should run in Safari, Firefox, Chrome, and Edge, and all the other, you know, Chromium based browsers as well. That is not acceptable. And again, I know I'm preaching in the choir, but like that's where you issue a holy war and you raise a stink about that and you don't stop until it gets better because. This is what happens where, you know, you'll have a business unit, have some sort of weird application. I remember I ran into something that required an out of date, unsupported version of Java on the endpoints to run. It was a Java endpoint application, which, you know, already is completely discontinued continued today, but at the time was just barely hanging on as a thing. And I was just flabbergasted that like nobody raised their hand and said, what are we doing? I mean, because Java used to be another major, major source of exploits all the time, right? You always had um, a new J2RE um, update all of the time. Anybody who lived through that remembers that. Browsers are the same thing, man. So again, I, I know I'm, I'm on the soapbox and I know everyone listening agrees with me, but gosh, um, if you run into this, you've just, you've got to run it down and just not let go sink your teeth into it and not let go because it's, it's not going to get better until that vendor commits to running standard code that runs in any browser release, not installing updates is really, really bad. And, you know, Andy, as long as we're on the subject of updates, we should mention for our users that uh, Google just announced recently, they're going to a different update cadence right? I believe it used to be six weeks and now it's moving to four. Is that right? I haven't heard that news, but. Oh, this was a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I believe it's four. So uh, forgive me if I get the numbers slightly off, but long story short, they were moving up the release schedule. So they're going to release versions of Chrome more rapidly. Um, and then Microsoft came in right behind and said, yeah, we're going to do that too with edge. But Microsoft also said, we're going to have another release channel that if every four weeks is just too darn fast for you, then you'll be able to do and install every other update, which will be like on an eight week cycle. 
And so they're going to have a supported model or supported channel to do that as well. So forgive me the details if I've got the you know number of weeks slightly wrong, but whatever it was, it was taking the existing supported the support cycle release cycle, and it was speeding it up slightly. And then Microsoft came in behind it and said, yes, we will do that, but we're also going to do a better channel, maybe for some of our enterprise users where six weeks is too rapid and it'll be eight. So something good to know as long as we're on the subject of browser updates. And I'm gonna add on one last thing to that, Adam, is that you know we talk about this all the time on the show about accepting risk and compromises in information security. And you know our job is not to be a blocker Right. Our job is to enable productivity, enable the users to do their job, but securely. And, you know, I've encountered situations in my career where a certain update will break something and they have to hold it back. Now, Adam's absolutely correct. You need to bring it up and you need to kind of hold your stance. Right. And that's your job as an information security defender. But sometimes you don't win that war. Sometimes it's a business critical app and they're like, nope, we can't. Like we just cannot update because our company will stop functioning because of this app. And of course, I mean, you're employed by that company. So if it's coming to a halt, then you're not gonna get paid. So, you know, you need to find other things around that, right? Like. Okay, maybe a secure web gateway like Zscaler. We talked about that, which also checks malicious websites and blocks certain things. Maybe you have a network tool that does the same thing like Cisco uh, Firepower or Darktrace or some other network detection tool. You have your endpoint protection. You have your email gateway, stuff like that, that defense in layers, right? So hopefully if it gets through one, it doesn't get through another. And then something that we did talk about months ago is administrative rights to your machine. I mean, if something does escape the sandbox, okay, now you have a box that the user is not an administrator on. That one thing mitigates a lot of risk. So you can do certain things and you say, okay, well, you don't want to update, but let's do these things. Okay, we're going to have to remove admin rights. You know, stuff like that. And if all that fails, you've done your job. You've informed them of the risk. It is their job to accept it, right? It is the CEO. It is the director of infrastructure, the director of IT. Someone who is in charge, who makes the decisions, who says, okay, probably someone from the business side. I get what you're saying, but we can't do it. We are going to accept the risk. And that's sometimes all you can do, right? But your job here is, of course, Yes. Inform them of the risk of not keeping up to date. It is absolutely one of the riskiest things that you can do to run an out-of-date browser. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess that was more my point, right? Is this is your chance to really sink your teeth into that this is super, super risky. Like, again, one of the riskiest things you can do and make sure the proper people have signed off on it. And then there should even be a cadence to revisit it, possibly, right? Like this should not be a forever exemption in your risk register. This should be something where we revisit and say, do we still need to accept this risk? Are you still aware of the risk? Oh, hey, a new leader has come in. Um, do you hate this vendor already? Good, we hate them too. <laughs> Maybe we can get this out of here now. So it needs to be revisited. A, a risk acceptance should not be a lifetime exception of risk um, because the risk environment changes over time. And so there needs to be some sort of cadence to revisit it. And that's what I mean by sink your teeth into. Um, Andy's right. Once you've done all you can do, move on. We all have to move on, but at the same time, don't let it go, right? Make sure it's still top of mind. It keeps being brought up and in, in an appropriate fashion, right? Like being, um, professionally persistent as I like to call it and, and try to run that down because that's just not something you want to go. Oh, okay. We're good. Um, as much as you can, right. I mean, there is a balancing act to Andy's really, really, really good point here. So it's hard, but man, yeah, try not to. Right. So 
I just am curious, Adam, what browser do you normally run personally? I know we talked about all these things from an enterprise aspect, but from a personal aspect, what do you normally run? Um, it, it, try as I can to get myself to use Edge on like iPhone. I, I just love the Safari UI better. So I probably do the majority of the browsing on my phone when I'm not at work. And so that's usually done in Safari. So I, I continue to try to get myself to use Edge because I like the sync. Um, when I'm at work, I usually have two Edge profiles open. I have my work profile and I have a personal profile. And so depending on what I want to hit, I use either one. But I um, we've talked many times on the show that I've been kind of trying to daily drive my Mac, even for work. And even on my Mac, I'm running Edge. So I, I am kind of practicing what I preach, and I just use the multiple profiles feature. So one is synced to my Azure AD account for Microsoft Corporate, and the other one is synced to a personal Microsoft account. And the sync you know, works roughly the same. They, they more or less work the same. It's just, you know, what's it being um, synced against? And um, that way I have that nice separation of favorites and, and history and everything else. So that's what I do. I, I still do have a soft spot in my heart for Safari. I've always been a, a pretty big Safari fan, but in all honesty, the, the sink of edge has won me over. Um, I really, really like that. Yeah. For me personally, I actually use Firefox as my default browser for my personal systems. And that's just because I'm a huge privacy advocate on top of the cybersecurity. And not to say that Edge isn't private. Microsoft, of course, treats privacy very, very seriously. And what I like about Microsoft is that they don't sell your data for profit. I mean, that's Google's business model. That's Facebook's business model, right? They they monetize your data. Where Microsoft, yes, I think I'm you're not gonna lie and say that they don't collect data, yeah. right? But you're not monetizing it in a fact that like for advertisers, right? You're probably collecting it to make products better, like to figure out how people use it and, and make the experience better. Well to be clear, Microsoft does have an ads business. Um it's not as big as some of the other guys that we probably wish it was. Um, but that, that is important to point out, but there's been lots of conversation very upfront and, and very excitedly about, um, Satya Nadella, CEO of Microsoft has said many times, privacy is a fundamental human right. Um, where I'm still waiting for somebody from Facebook or Google to say that out loud. Um, and there's features in edge that are designed specifically to, you know, prevent cross site tracking and prevent other tracking cookies and, and other stuff like that. So certainly there's an ads business, but I think to your point, it's less desirous to build that in-depth dossier of Andy jaw to serve you the exact perfect ads at the perfect time. And I think it's a more genericized ads business. Obviously there's going to be some collection of information because that's, it's kind of endemic to the industry, but I imagine a lot less. And the browser itself is designed to restrict the ability to collect that information. Yeah, for sure. And I was happy to see too, that right now, at least Microsoft is blocking the new feature from Google called Google flock, which is kind of like their new tracking ID that they plan on rolling out and it may be a better model than what we have now with the cookies and the tracking that is going on now, but at least for the time being until it kind of flushes out, Microsoft has blocked it in edge. And of course, Firefox has blocked it as well. You know, and, and that we could do a whole show on this and maybe we should at some point, but as I like to point out, there are absolutely businesses that have thrived without incredibly detailed personal information, television, radio, podcasting, look at podcasts. I mean, they, 
they have tried multiple times to create these different business models like luminary and, and all this stuff um, where they can capture more information about how you listen, what kind of things you do while you listen and all this and that. But at the end of the day, podcasting with its lack of telemetry and lack of detail, they literally get like an IP address and a user agent has not just survived, but thrived without collecting a treasure trove of personal information. I mean, twit, well, found by Leo Laporte, what, 15 years ago, and has done amazingly well with just um, an, an annual opt-in survey to collect some information on their user demographics or their listener demographics. And otherwise, that's it, right? There's no ubiquitous tracking across everything you do. So this idea that, and I know I'm working off topic, but that advertisers like have to collect information or like they can't exist is is absurd, right? That that entire business didn't exist 20 years ago. And advertising has been around much longer than that. And so we kind of get told like, well, we have to collect information. Otherwise, we can't serve you targeted ads. And we can't do this. And we can't do that. And it's like, podcasting's doing just fine without that. So I'm not quite sure I buy that. Anyhow, I'll get off my soapbox on advertising and privacy because we could do a whole show on that. But uh, agreed, it's everyone's taking this wait and see attitude to Google's um, flock concept, and it might be better. But what would be better yet is if we just didn't need to create fingerprints or dossiers or um, treasure troves of personal data to serve ads. But tell that to you know several. <laughs> multi-billion dollar tech companies. The last thing I'll add is kind of, again, if you allow users to have administrative rights, they are most likely going to install the browser of their choice. That's kind of common knowledge, right? You're going to expect that. So it would behoove you to have these policies in place because whether or not you install the browser or they install the browser, if you have a policy in place to manage it, it will manage the browser. So I would recommend to have a policy in place for all the browsers because you can. And if you allow administrative rights, most likely you're gonna have users who are using it. So if you don't allow administrative rights, which is what I would typically recommend for most organizations for their users, have it as a set thing, approved apps, then you know that they can't install a different browser. So then you can have less work on the management side and you don't have to build all these different profiles. Anything else, Adam? We talked a lot tonight. <laughs> this is a good show. Uh, browsers are, are amazing products and we have a bunch of really good ones, but Wrap your arms around them, keep them updated, do common sense settings. But, you know, at the same time, I mean, browser is, is somebody's primary um, conduit to the outside world. And so, as always, as we encourage on this show, deliver a great user experience too. We can do both. We can secure all the things, but we can still let people get their work done, have a little bit of a break, and keep our company secure and keep our users happy. We can do all the things. So let's, let's try. And that's our show for tonight. Thanks for listening. As always, our contact information will be in the show notes. If you guys have any questions about the episode or have security topics you want us to talk about. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.